afternoon. My name is Tom Lindsay, and I work at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and I'm honored to be part of this NAS conference. And we have a very interesting panel. My name is Tom Lindsay, and I work at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and I'm honored to be part of this NAS conference. And we have a very interesting panel. My name is Tom Lindsay, and I work at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and I'm I'm sorry, we had some technical difficulty there. I don't know if you heard me uh, speak as if I was in an echo chamber, but I did. So we'll try again. As I said, I'm Tom Lindsay. I work at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and I'm very happy here to be part of this, this conference and to moderate the try again. Dear Tom, As I said, I'm Tom Lindsay. I work at the Texas Public Policy I think Public you must Policy have Foundation. an extra and I'm thing very on happy the here to be there. part of this, this conference and to moderate the try again. Dear Tom. As I said, I'm Tom Lindsay. Here we go. All right, Tom. See, we will try again here. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Tom Lindsay, and I'm very happy here to be presenting uh, at this conference and to get the chance to moderate uh, a very interesting question as we examine the 1619 project. And that is the question not, of, not only about what the 1619 project includes, but what it does not include. And uh, our guests, uh, our experts that will be speaking this afternoon are first, uh, Professor Diana Schaub, who is a professor of political science at Loyola University in Maryland. She's an authority on Frederick Douglass. And then we also have, he's not on screen now, but we also uh, are expecting Professor John Stauffer to come. And he's a professor of English, American Studies and African American Studies at Harvard University. And he's also an authority on the white abolitionist tradition. Now, the procedure that we're, we're following this afternoon is this. We have extracted some uh, statements from the 1619 Project in which we're going to ask our two experts to respond. Begin with you, Professor Schaub. The, the prompt that you've been asked to respond to is the following. The 169, 1619 Project states this, quote, the truth is that as much democracy as this nation has today, it has been born on the backs of black resistance." End quote. Professor Schaub? Yes, thanks. Uh, I think I'll begin controversially by starting with Thomas Jefferson. Uh, in Notes on the State of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson expressed his fear that the institution of human bondage damaged both slaveholders and slaves. As he put it, put, permitting one half the citizens thus to trample on the rights of the other half transforms those into despots and these into enemies, destroys the morals of the one part and the amor patriae of the other. Nicole Hannah-Jones, author of the 1619 Project's lead essay, certainly agrees about the low morals of slaveholders. Indeed, according to her, it isn't just slaveholders who were cruel and hypocritical. All white Americans then and now share in what she considers to be the racist DNA of the nation. Yet, interestingly, she disagrees with Jefferson about black patriotism. She points out that enslaved people from the first moments of freedom overwhelmingly regarded the United States as their country. Her essay is an attempt to explain and validate this patriotism. She begins with the story of her father, who always prominently flew an American flag. This was an act that her younger self found incomprehensible. What could account for his unshakable sense of belonging? After all, her father had been born in the apartheid state of Mississippi and suffered life-sapping insults even after relocating north. The answer she arrives at is that Blacks do most emphatically belong. According to her account of history, African Americans are responsible for the great wealth of the nation, responsible for whatever measure of true democracy it has managed to achieve, and for good measure, responsible also for the only original aspects of American culture. Her patriotism would, I think, have to be called chauvinistic. This conference will be highlighting the 1619 Project's many misrepresentations of American history, its appalling errors, both of omission and commission. However, as we engage in that critique, 
we should keep in mind the patriotic framing of the lead essay. Hannah Jones is asking the question that has always been the starting point of Black political thought. What country have I? The question was first formulated by Frederick Douglass in an 1847 speech to the American Anti-Slavery Society. His answer at that time, 1847, was that he had no country. Since the political and religious institutions did not acknowledge him as a man, instead seeing him only as a chattel, and in his case, an escaped chattel. As a fugitive from slavery, whose three million brethren were still groaning beneath the iron rod of the worst despotism that could be devised, Douglas began from a position of radical alienation. Moreover, after his flight north from Maryland to Massachusetts, he joined up with the Garrisonian abolitionists and was persuaded to adopt their hatred of the US Constitution. For the first decade of his career, from 1841 to 1851, Douglas called for the overthrow of the government, desiring to see, quote, its constitution shivered in a thousand fragments rather than this foul curse should continue. While always remaining an agitator of the first water, Douglas eventually rethought his revolutionary stance. Through assiduous study of the constitution and the rules of textual interpretation, Douglas came to reject the Garrisonians' pro-slavery reading of the constitution. And as a result of that seismic shift in his understanding of the national charter, he embraced a more positive view of the founding generation and its achievement, as well as a new view of how he and his people fit into the American story. As we learn from Douglas's evolving thought, the remedy for bad history is more history. History that disdains the temptations of ideology and chauvinism. Douglas's first great speech after this transformation is entitled, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? Clearly, he's still raising uncomfortable questions uh, and still analyzing things from the perspective of the slave. But the speech itself articulates a profound and complexly balanced patriotism. To my mind, Frederick Douglass stands as the model for how to apportion and combine praise and blame when assessing the American record on race. Revealingly, Hannah Jones does not mention Douglas, does not once, once mention Frederick Douglass, although she does quote from his contemporary, Martin Delaney, as well as from her favorite radical, W.E.B. Du Bois. It's perhaps worth noting that both Delaney and Du Bois are associated with black nationalism and pan-Africanism and each would forsake residence in the United States uh, permanently in Du Bois's case and for many years in Delaney's. These intellectual antecedents illustrate, I think, how unsustainable Hannah Jones's current position is. Not only is her account seriously at odds with the facts, but it's psychologically uh, and politically untenable. It's hard to square the alienation of black nationalism with a strong assertion of American patriotism. So what she ends up with is a pretty extreme version of black chauvinism, as if African-Americans have been the only good and decent citizens, uh, and as if protest with a capital P is the only acceptable form of political action. Now, of course, many black thinkers before her uh, have described the special relationship of blacks to America. Douglas declared that the destiny of the nation has the Negro for its pivot. Uh, du Bois followed suit, asserting that there are today no truer exponents of the pure human spirit of the Declaration of Independence than the American Negroes. Hannah Jones takes such statements much further, making Blacks the sole beacon of hope in this terrible white world. For her, celebration of the black contribution requires denigrating or at least overlooking the contribution of others. Yet surely generations of free laborers of other races and ethnicities contributed something to the wealth of the nation. And on the political side, while it might be true that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, it is also true that practically speaking, the condition for the eventual liberty of all was the prior liberty of some. Uh, as they tell you on the airplane, when the oxygen masks descend, secure your own mask before assisting others. 
without the liberty the colonists sought for themselves, there would have been no nation for the 1619 project to misrepresent. Which brings us back uh, to Douglas's 4th of July address. In this speech, Douglas most assuredly damns elements of the nation's conduct, but he never damns America, never says anything remotely like Hannah Jones's opening salvo. Quote from her, our, the opening sentence, our founding ideals of liberty and equality were false when they were written. By the way, that statement, for all its seeming boldness, is weirdly imprecise. If all she means is that the ideals, though worthy, were unrealized, uh, no one would disagree, uh, especially not the American revolutionaries who were hazarding life, fortune, and sacred honor to begin the arduous process of turning ideals into reality. If, however, she means, as she later hints, that the drafters of the document did not include Blacks within the category of human beings endowed by their creator with natural rights, then I believe she is fundamentally wrong and that the universalism of their intentions can be proved against her. Certainly, Douglas would disagree with today's knee-jerk assumption that the founders restricted all men to just a few men or a few categories of men, such as those who were white, male, and property owning like themselves. Douglas spends the opening third of his long speech celebrating the revolution. He calls the principles set forth in the Declaration of Independence saving principles. Further, he believes that the signers understood the revolutionary trajectory of their principles. With them, he says, nothing was settled that was not right. With them, justice, liberty, and humanity were final, not slavery and oppression. Now, Douglas admits that, quote, the point from which I am compelled to view the founders is not certainly the most favorable. Nonetheless, he insists, I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less than admiration. They were statesmen, patriots, and heroes, and for the good they did and the principles they contended for, I will unite with you to honor their memory. Douglas's respect for the fathers of the Republic is, however, expressed from a certain distance, uh, a distance felt most poignantly in his repeated references to your fathers, your national independence, your political freedom, your great deliverance, your national life, and your national poetry and eloquence. This 4th of July, 1847, is not his, uh, or at least his claim to the date is not admitted by those whom he nonetheless addresses as fellow citizens. It is these fellow citizens, the sons of the fathers, whom Douglas disdains for betraying the promise of the revolution. Douglas compares the Americans of his day to the children of Jacob who boasted, we have Abraham to our father, when they had long lost Abraham's faith and spirit. As he shifts to the great middle of his speech, uh, which is concerned solely with the deficiencies of that present, Douglas delivers a most remarkable transition sentence. I leave, quote, I leave therefore the great deeds of your fathers to other gentlemen whose claim to have been regularly descended will be less likely to be disputed than mine. With suggestive though still decorous irony, Douglas, whose father was assumed to be his white master, lets the audience know that he too is connected by blood to the fathers. Although not regularly descended, since slave offspring were not legally acknowledged, Douglas hints that he, as the natural son, is closer to the spirit of that revolutionary generation than the degraded regular sons are. The central section of the 4th of July speech is a searing critique of slavery and its institutional supports, including the churches. Douglas describes how organized religion, false to its authentic mission, has made itself the bulwark of American slavery. Even at his most fiery, Douglas is fair. Although vowing to use the severest language he can command, he also promises 
that not a word shall escape me that any man who is not at heart a slaveholder shall not confess to be right and just. Throughout, he castigates the great sin and shame of America rather than America itself. His special target is the inconsistency and hypocrisy of the nation. The oft quoted last paragraph of the central section captures the flavor. Let me just read uh, a couple of sentences from that. The existence of slavery in this country brands your republicanism as a sham, your humanity as a base pretense and your Christianity as a lie. It destroys your moral power abroad. It corrupts your politicians at home. It saps the foundation of religion. It makes your name a hissing and a byword to a mocking earth. It is the antagonistic force in your government. The only thing that seriously disturbs and endangers your union. Douglas's polemic works. It works by summoning the present generation to be true to the nation's saving principles. This is, I think, a far cry from the contemporary claim that America was founded upon white supremacy and nothing but white supremacy. Just as Frederick Douglass and Hannah Jones disagree about the significance of 1776, they disagree about the meaning of 1787. Douglas transitions to the third and final section of his address by acknowledging that there are those who insist that property in man is guaranteed and sanctioned by the Constitution of the United States. He had once been one of that company, but by 1852, Douglas praises the Constitution, praises it as the best weapon in the anti-slavery arsenal. To wield it effectively, however, required that it be freed from the corrosive distortions of the slaveholders interpretation. Douglas pleads with his audience, fellow citizens, there is no matter in respect to which the people of the North have allowed themselves to be so ruinously imposed upon as that of the pro-slavery character of the Constitution. In that instrument, I hold there is neither warrant, license, nor sanction of the hateful thing, but interpreted as it ought to be interpreted, the Constitution is a glorious liberty document. Douglass's anti-slavery reading of the Constitution is most fully on display uh, in his masterful 1860 speech in Scotland. Paying strict attention to the words themselves, Douglas points out that slavery nowhere received federal authorization. The word itself was absent from the document. Even in those few clauses that were traditionally understood to have application to slavery, those referred to are always called persons and their situation as in their importation, is a function purely of municipal or state law, not federal law. In addition to stressing a plain and common sense construal of the language, Douglas also focuses on the intention of the drafters as it could be discerned from the text, supplemented by contemporaneous accounts, uh, such as Madison's notes, notes from the uh, Constitutional Convention. Douglas argues, for instance, that providing for future congressional action against the international slave trade revealed the drafters' anti-slavery intentions. Although it was true that the trade was given a 20-year stay of uh, execution since Congress was forbidden to act until 1808, nonetheless, the framers readied the ax to fall. Moreover, they did so in the sincere belief that the institution itself would die if this main artery were cut. Finally, Douglas emphasizes the governing force of the preamble as the spirit that should guide the interpretation of each article, section, and clause. He sees no reason to believe that persons of his complexion were excluded from we, the people. As he points out uh, in another speech, the Dred Scott speech, uh, at the time of the ratification of the Constitution, free black men exercised the franchise uh, in nearly all of the states. They were part of we the people, not just prospectively, but actually and actively as citizens and voters. Today's progressives, uh, in order to pursue their vendetta against the past, against the past, have perversely joined 
the Southern Slavocrats and their Northern dupes in grossly misconstruing the character of the Constitution. To the radicals of his day uh, who made that same mistake, Douglas was unsparing. How dare any man who pretends to be a friend to the Negro thus gratuitously concede away what the Negro has a right to claim under the Constitution? I suspect he would repeat his rebuke today. What good can come from arguing, as Hannah Jones does, that there is a straight line from the Constitution of 1787 to the Dred Scott decision of 1857? One would have no sense from reading her essay that Tawney's opinion in the case was widely regarded as a travesty of justice. Douglas labeled it this judicious, I'm sorry, uh, this judicial incarnation of wolfishness. And it wasn't just abolitionists who were outraged. The platform of the Republican Party called for Dred Scott to be overruled. Oblivious to this resistance in the free states, Hannah Jones asserts that, quote, the Supreme Court enshrined racist thinking. While the decision certainly was a clear example of racism in high places, the court did not manage to enshrine such views. Quite the opposite, the Dred Scott case was one of the prime catalysts of the Civil War. Frederick Douglass, uh, who was astute in discerning silver linings, took heart from the atrocious decision, believing correctly that Dred Scott would arouse the national conscience. In keeping with his faith in the future, the great abolitionist orator ended most of his speeches on an uplifting note. This is especially true of the 4th of July speech. Douglas's hopefulness is well-sourced for it is grounded in the saving principles of the Declaration and that glorious liberty document, the US Constitution. These are the twin charters, the praise of which bookends his criticism of American practices. Hannah Jones, let it be said, also ends on a hopeful note. She tells the affecting story of a school assignment that required her to research the land of her ancestors and submit a drawing of its flag. Meant to celebrate America as a nation of immigrants, the project put the two black students in the class in an awkward position. At a loss, she picked at random an African country. In hindsight, she wishes she had claimed the American flag as her own true heritage. Her patriotic impulse is right, but she has only half the story, her half, about the contribution, the real contribution of black people to the building of the nation, both materially and morally. Frederick Douglass could help her and all Americans see that their belonging could be much more fully rounded. What is needed is a project to reclaim the Declaration and the Constitution, to rescue the founders from their unfair detractors, and to remember all of those in subsequent generations, white and black, who struggled often together to bring the nation to its best self. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Shaw. That's a very illuminating presentation. And I think uh, you mentioned at, at the beginning of your presentation that uh, Jones doesn't give much attention at all, if any, to Frederick Douglass. And we see the uh, perhaps one reason why, because it certainly contradicts the account that the New York Times 1619 Project wants to present. Uh, thank you. And we will return to you uh, uh, with questions uh, next, we will go to Professor John Stauffer. Professor Stauffer, thank you for thank you for attending. And let me tell the audience a little bit about you, sir. You're a professor of English, American Studies, and African American Studies at Harvard University. You're an expert in the white abolitionist tradition. The prompt that we've selected for you, and uh, Professor Stauffer, uh, from the 1619 Project, reads as follows: <clears throat> Quote. By the early 1800s, according to the legal historians Leland Ware, Robert Cottrell, and Raymond, and, Rich, and Raymond T. Diamond, white Americans, whether they engaged in slavery or not, 
had a quote, had a considerable psychological as well as economic investment in the doctrine of black inferiority, unquote. While liberty was the inalienable right of the people who would be considered white, enslavement and subjugation became the natural station of people who had any discernible drop of black blood. The Supreme Court enshrined this thinking in the law in its 1857 Dred Scott decision, ruling that black people, whether enslaved or free, came from a slave race, unquote. So that's a gross um, overgeneralization. Uh, I think it's important to um, to pick it apart both chronologically and geographically. Um, one of the things that has, I should say, I'll, I'll begin by saying that the abolition movement, and I'm not just, a, I mean, to be a scholar of abolitionism means you have to be a scholar of both black and white abolitionists. It was an integrated movement from the beginning. Um, uh, blacks were the first abolitionists, former slaves who, as one of the defining aspects of slavery is that one is denied a voice, a public voice, and having that public voice to be able to disseminate it and to speak firsthand about the sins or crimes of slavery um, what can mobilize a group of people. One of, the, one of the big successes that flows from the founding of the country is the emancipation of slavery in uh, the northern states, uh, which was uh, all gradual, but a large success. And in fact, uh, the, the founding um, reflected the degree to which slavery was so widespread in Western culture. The Vermont Constitution was the first constitution in world history to abolish slavery. Uh, that's um, how new or comparatively new the idea of anti-slavery was and that uh, Vermont had uh, very few box, but box were very much part of uh, the uh, anti-slavery movement. In general, um, the Eastern states uh, who had both in Vermont and Massachusetts, uh, the Northeast states, uh, Massachusetts, for example, um, provided uh, unrestricted suffrage for African Americans from shortly after the revolution through the antebellum period. Um, and uh, so there were, in effect, by the 1850s, there were suffrage restrictions on the Irish because they were seen as more of a threat. They were seen as a separate race. Uh, there were very few blacks in uh, Massachusetts, less than 1%, but they did have unrestricted suffrage. There were a handful of states that uh, provided that. The states that were the most racist and racism was profound were the Midwestern states in part because Midwestern states were settled and became states primarily because of poor white Southerners who wanted to, who felt, who wanted to, uh, did not want to become workers on a plantation to have their own farms, but as Southerners uh, had these, were much more racist in their views. So Illinois, Indiana, the Lincoln state of Illinois, there were essentially what uh, have been known as sundown laws where blacks could not be citizens in the state by law. Although in Lincoln's, uh, uh, in, in Illinois, there were, um, uh, there were, there were new, there were, I mean, a small percentage, but there were still blacks who lived there. Same with Indiana. Indiana was uh, a racist state, uh, more racist. Um, and some states like Ohio, Northern Ohio was very different from Southern Ohio. Uh, Northern Ohio was a hotbed of uh, abolitionism. And uh, so uh, it's important on uh, where you move. A major point that not just scholars of the United States, but of um, of world the world history of slavery and of race is that as uh, as the number of free blacks increase, that's when racism increases. And as I've suggested, when in those like Massachusetts which one prided itself on freedom, saw it, I mean, according to the census, uh, Massachusetts was the first state that uh, had no slaves because the grad, the, all the first emancipation movements were gradual emancipation movements. 
Massachusetts um, as, uh, as uh, a state. Um, uh, once there were very few blacks in the states in, in Massachusetts, and so it was able to become uh, enjoy the blacks were, in, uh, were able to enjoy uh, unrestricted suffrage. But as northern states emancipated slaves and free blacks became a larger part of the population, that's when racism grew, particularly in those areas where whites saw them as a threat. Um, and it's why in, as I said, in the Midwestern states, there was, they were perceived as much more of a threat. They were perceived as, uh, and they had uh, few legal rights. Um, it's important to remember that over 90% of African Americans were live, lived in the South. And in fact, most free blacks, the, there were more free blacks living in the, in the slave states than there were in the free states, in, primarily because they had family members and they were unwilling to leave family members who were slaves. So the number of free blacks was, compa was comparatively very small, but they had a disproportionately huge role in disseminating the abolition um, movement and the voice and the advocacy uh, for universal freedom. The efforts to try to force Americans in general to live up to the ideals of freedom uh, and uh, equality in the Declaration. Um, that was uh, that was profound, um, and in fact, one of one of the differences um, begin well beginning in the late 1820s. The very definition of an abolitionist changed for, from the Constitution or from the um, the uh, the Revolutionary period until the 1820s. An abolitionist was one who simply advocated an end of slavery not necessarily immediately, but an end to slavery. Imagine the world wanted, the good society was a world without slavery. Uh, and as the free black population grew and free blacks started to insist upon um, much more immediate emancipation because by 1804, the last Northern state had uh, freed slaves. And so the, the emancipation movement stalled in the 1820, by the 1820s, African Americans really came to lead the abolition movement and emphasize the importance of of of, uh, of uh, quickness of you know we can't wait forever, and so by the time of David Walker's appeal uh, in 1829 and then William Lloyd Garrison's and the first black newspaper, Freedom's Journal, uh, that then was an inspiration for Garrison's Liberator and then other abolitionist newspapers. The definition of an abolitionist was someone who advocated as swift as possible end to slavery uh, and in theory, racial equality. Now, a number of whites were unable to realize that ideal of racial equality, but what's significant about the abolition movement is they grappled with it. They understood the importance of equality um, for all people, equal rights under the law. In fact, the abolition movement beginning in the 1830s uh, is when the first iteration or uh, de dissemination of human rights and civil rights were developed by the abolitionists, black and white abolitionists. And they meant by human rights what human rights came to be understood in 1948 and beyond is this understanding of equality before the law for everyone uh, and, uh, and so not just freedom, but equal rights and protections. Uh, and abolitionists were the first group to really disseminate the idea, both black and white. Um, and whether it's Frederick Douglass or James and McCune Smith or David Walker, they recognize the, the power of uh, racism. Um, and of race, both blacks and whites did. And in fact, Frederick Douglass's second autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom, it's the first slave narrative to include, to, to, is organized by my life as a slave and my life as a free man. Why does he talk about his life as a free man? Because he wants to expose racism that, and, and highlight the degree to which racism and slavery become twinned. Um, racism helps justify slavery. Um, it provides uh, slave owners and a way of not feeling guilty about dehumanizing another human being. 
in a sense, you could say that racism in one sense is a way of exorcising one's guilt about trying to dehumanizing, dehumanize another human being. Um, and that increases uh, with the rise and the, um, the voice, the public voice of uh, African-Americans who are insisting uh, upon uh, their freedom uh, and their uh, equal rights. Uh, and uh, so by 1857, the Taney's uh, Dred Scott decision has been mentioned more than once. It was, it was actually a huge spur to abolitionists and anti-slavery. And I said that it, by 1830s, the abolitionists were people who advocated for a swift end of slavery and racial equality. The largest group of Northerners called themselves anti-slavery advocates. And anti-slavery advocates recognize that slavery is a sin, slavery is wrong, it needs to be abolished, but it was gradual. And most anti-slavery advocates um, did not advocate racial equality. Um, and so, I mean, Lincoln is a very good example. I mean, he was willing to, I mean, when, in his debates with Stephen Douglas, Stephen Douglas is a profound race baiter. But had Lincoln or especially any politician in Illinois and Indiana, if you wanted to get elected and you champion racial equality, there's no way you're going to get elected. There's no way. So, it, it, you know, you're being pragmatic. Um, uh, you're, being, you're, you're being pragmatic as a politician. Um, but what's significant and mo uh, mo from 1930s, really for almost all of the 20th century until a few years ago, people had argued that the abolitionists and the anti-slavery advocates were at odds. They didn't work together. And that's simply not true. The abolitionists, even though they recognized that the Free Soil Party, that the Republican Party did not have racial equality as its foundation, their vision of ending slavery was very broad, but anti-slavery was central to their platform. Douglas, stumped for numerous Republican candidates. Other black and white abolitionists also stumped for Republican candidates. Even when Douglas himself is a member, is a founding member of the Radical Abolition Party, or the, the uh, National Liberty Party, which is a radical wing of, uh, that, that comes out of the Liberty Party. So in a sense, what these radical third parties, they understand part of their mission is to work with the mainstream party, in this case, the Republican Party, to try to push it to a more progressive position. And the, the, the degree to which radicals and, and moderates, radicals and liberals work together is, was profound, and it's how social change occurs. You know, there's a long debate on protest and social change, and a number of scholars say social change only occurs from radicals at the margins. That's not true. Radicals at the margin, especially in democracy, have to be able to influence and change the minds of the policymakers. It's this messy but rich collaboration between abolitionists and anti-slavery advocates uh, that then leads to the rise of the Republican Party. And the Republican Party was, in my view, a truly revolutionary party. It's the first national party that comes out of the Free Soul Party. A national party whose central platform is that slavery is an evil at a time in which the wealthiest, most powerful Americans were Southern planters. In fact, Charles Sumner in the 1850 census did an analysis of the census and recognized that 0.4% of the population were the, by far the wealthiest Americans. It was 0.4% of the population who owned 10 or more slaves. And if you owned 10 slaves in 1850, you were the equivalent of a multimillionaire today. Uh, and so that's where the term slave power came from. It was an oligarchy of a small handful of immensely wealthy elite uh, slave-owning Southerners who were trying to hijack the nation and spread slavery throughout the country. For most of the 20th century, the idea of the slave power was seen as this a conspiracy. It was uh, not based in fact, uh, that it reflected these uh, irrational fears of Northern anti-slavery people and abolitionists. 
which is not true. I mean, Southerners did control, uh, they had a disproportionate control over uh, the government. And it's what Douglas and it's what uh, both anti-slavery advocates, the Republican party really was fighting against. Um, they were fighting against that. And Southerners made it very clear that if an anti-slavery politician were elected president, they'd be out, they would leave the country. Their, their loyalty to slavery was far greater than their loyalty to a nation, uh, which is exactly what happened. The day after Lincoln was elected in 1860, South Carolina announces its secession convention, the day after. By the time Lincoln delivers his inaugural address, seven states had already seceded and the Confederacy had already been formed. So the large takeaway is uh, it's impossible to think, to, to define the white abolition movement uh, without discussing the black abolitionists. Um, they worked together, they collaborated. Uh, and the, by, as I said, by 1830, the very term abolitionist meant something different than what, what, what it had meant in uh, the first successful emancipation movement where these abolitionists who were not, um, were not immediatists were successfully able to emancipate slavery in the northern states. Without that, and that's one of the overlooked uh, aspects of uh, the uh, abolition movement, the huge success of the emancipation of the northern states. Uh, at a time in which slavery is becoming more and more profitable, especially, I mean, the cotton gin was invented and in, I think it was before 1800. Uh, by 1820s, cotton was hugely profitable. By 1850, the United States produced uh, over a third of, over a half of the world's cotton supply. Um, they made money hand over fist. Uh, and uh, the wealthiest Americans were Southerners. And so this, uh, those opposed to slavery work together to, to create multiple political um, organizations. Garrison, I mean, a lot Garrison and the American Anti-Slavery Society has been often criticized because they interpreted the constitution as a pro-slavery document. And so in a sense, they saw themselves as standing outside the framework of the federal government. But that was a strategy, that was a technique as a way to uh, raise consciousness and really to pressure people to take seriously the idea of how horrible slavery was, which explains why as soon as civil war breaks out, as soon as the Southerners bomb Fort Sumner and start the civil war, Garrison becomes whole hog in support of Lincoln's Republican Party. Same with every other American anti-slavery advocate. It's like, okay, now we don't need pro-slavery constitu pro constitution. Now, everyone recognizes that the constitution is on our side. We'll jettison it. And that's, a, you know, essentially it's a sign of a good activist. You, you use any tool that you can to help you achieve your aim. And Garrison, and Garrison in one sense is right at acknowledging the pro-slavery nature of the constitution because Southerners had control of the country. Uh, by 1850s, you know, a lot of Southerners wanted to rewrite the Declaration of Independence, you know, including Stephen Douglas, who's not even, a, you know, he's an Illinoisan. So it's important to recognize the strategy rather than the philosophy, um, which explains why someone like, like Garrison, like Phillips, like all the other American anti-slavery advocates, as soon as Southerners bomb Fort Sumner, they are completely on board the United States and the Republican Party. And the other thing I would say is that there were periods, I mean, the abolition movement required among the participants and the abolitionists themselves were a tiny group. It's less than point, less than 1% of the population. Anti-slavery advocates increased arguably after the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, um, and especially after the Kansas-Nebraska Act, most Northerners 
were became anti-slavery. Hence the rise of the Republican Party and the Republican Party, which is founded immediately after the Kansas Nebraska Act. John C. Fremont comes, the very first Republican candidate comes close to winning the election. I mean, that's stunning how many votes he gets from a brand new party. Which highlights the, the number of anti-slavery advocates in the North. Working, as I said, and in, in their letters, in their correspondence, they're very clear that Douglas and uh, Garrett Smith and Garrison, even who's still advocating disunion, is working with pressuring, wanting to pressure the Republican Party to be more progressive and recognizing the importance of it. Um, and it's true with any effective radical party is that the members, the number of members in a democracy are tiny so that you're not gonna get elected, but you can, you can encourage or pressure the mainstream party to be more um, focused or progressive in terms of the goals that you want. Um, and hence Douglas taking time out of his very busy schedule. I mean, he was one of the one of the most he was one of the high, if not the one of the highest paid lecturers at a time in the golden age of oratory when many writers made their money as lectures. He took time out to stump for Republican candidates to stump for other because he recognized although they might be racist and although their vision of ending slavery was very gradual, the Republican Party helped him help them. And that's, uh, that's been true with protest move, successful protest movements in general is that radicals and moderates work together to achieve change that's less than what the radicals hope, and in some cases more than what moderates are hoping for. So in that sense, and I'll, I can end there, is the, the abolition movement was one of the first really su great, successful, despite its limitations, uh, uh, which I can talk about the limitations as reflected, for example, in the, the truly revolutionary Reconstruction Amendments. The Reconstruction Amendments, as Akhil Amar and virtually every other legal scholar has pointed out, radically transformed the Constitution. Um, equality is, 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 enters into the Constitution with the 14th Amendment. It's, it's referred to in the Declaration, but not the Constitution until the 14th Amendment. And they're problematic, but that still, it, it makes possible the civil rights movement of the 20th century. Um, and... Uh, but so the upshot is that despite the limitations, the abolition movement was a profound success. Without it, um, I should just say Southerners, Southerners felt themselves to be the true conservatives. Um, they, if you were a white Southerner who grew up on a plantation, you're born in 1820, uh, by 1850, you had assumed that slavery was a natural condition. And by 1850, everywhere, the rest of the world is abolishing slavery. By 1850, the United States was the largest slave society on earth. And then by 1850, the only other slave communities or slave societies uh, in Western culture left uh, were Brazil, uh, Dutch Guiana, uh, and Cuba. And United States had far more slaves. So the Southerners saw this wave of emancipation sweeping over the new world and they dug in their heels firmer and firmer and became more aggressive, which is why they sought to take over some of Central America for slavery, why they waged war against Mexico, uh, because they wanted to expand, they wanted to reverse this wave of emancipation and expand slavery back through uh, and into a Central America and uh, acquire a greater empire uh, in order to uh, reverse this wave and become even wealthier and more powerful. Thank you, Professor Stouffer. Uh, thank you, Professor Schaub.
you know, I, after hearing how you both so expertly dismantle those two planks that we uh, took from the 1619 project, let me ask the next question, the deeper question from both of you. And that's this, what are the origins of the current attacks on the Constitution and the American Republic? And then second, why should Americans care? Uh, so the, I mean, part of the origins of um, the Constitution is that, you know, when it was, when it was written and ratified, you know, and so in 1787, um, northern states were beginning to abolish slavery. Um, certainly the delegates from Massachusetts um, were opposed to slavery. And in the Chesapeake, uh, slavery still existed, but the profitability of slavery had declined dramatically because tobacco was the main crop and they refused to rotate the soil. And so the tobacco crop was, was no longer as profitable. A, a central framework for the Constitutional Convention was to create a document that all delegates, that, that all delegates could support um, without excluding. And the two, um, it was Georgia and South Carolina delegates in which slavery was still hugely profitable and successful. That's where uh, they were the ones more, you know, disproportionately, disproportionately the ones that, uh, that created a, a, a compromised constitution. In fact, um, a couple scholars have have, in, have indulged in counterfactual and said, let's say the, the uh, framers of the constitution were willing to sacrifice delegates, sacrifice Georgia and South Carolina. Had they been willing to do that, a constitution could have been created that would have abolished slavery everywhere in 50 years. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to weigh in on this question of where this uh, interpretation of the Constitution comes from. Uh, I mean, it, it seems to me in some way uh, she is taking up the slaveholders reading, uh, pro-slavery reading of the Constitution. They construed those compromises in the Constitution as a kind of moral mandate to maintain slavery uh, forever. Uh, and I... Uh, I guess I want to level a little bit more of a criticism at the Garrisonian wing of the abolitionists for joining in on that pro-slavery interpretation of the Constitution and holding to it. Uh, you know, uh, John Stuffer pointed out that they uh, threw it overboard uh, at the moment of Lincoln's election or at the moment of secession. But uh, I mean, I think it's a real question why Garrison wasn't willing to jettison that pro-slavery reading of the Constitution earlier. Uh, you see Douglas working his way uh, through this matter of constitutional interpretation and changing his mind uh, about it, uh, both for purposes of, I think, greater political realism, uh, you know, shifting from being a revolutionary to being a, uh, to being a reformer. Uh, and but also because he, I think, genuinely, sincerely came to believe that it was the more accurate reading of the Constitution. Now, we might still have some quarrel with Frederick Douglass on some of the particulars of his reading, uh, maybe especially with respect to the Fugitive Slave Clause. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is, a, it is a strange thing that this interpretation of the Constitution that we had to uh, refute and overthrow through uh, civil war and constitutional amendment uh, now seems to be holding the field. Um, I also think that uh, the sort of black nationalist understanding, the understanding of the nation that comes from Malcolm X and his heirs is, you know, playing a big role in this. Uh, and that's what I, I find really so contradictory about, uh, about her, because she both is embracing that black nationalist reading of the nation that it was just, you know, white power at work and nothing but white power, uh, while actually trying to um, find a, a way to be patriotic. 
And I just think that's a really uh, hard thing for her to square. Uh, as to your other question, why does it matter? <laughs> I mean, our future is at stake. Our self-understanding as a nation is at stake. So it really is like that moment when, you know, Lincoln takes on Stephen Douglas. I mean, that was also a moment in which the nation's fundamental self-understanding was at stake. And I, I think we're at a similar moment right now. And, uh, you know, while we, uh, while we don't have, uh, have Lincoln or Frederick Douglass with us any longer, maybe if we uh, try to be better scholars of those folks, we will we'll come through it. Yeah, yeah I, would just, I would say one thing to your uh, point on Douglas. I've written on him a fair amount myself. I would call him a revolutionary throughout the 1850s. Um, I mean, he, by the 1850s, um, it downplays in what to the slave is the 4th of July. First, I mean, it's in part because his audience is mostly white audience there. Um, whereas when he gives talks to uh, his black audiences, when he gives talks to radicals, um, and in fact, one of the one of the annual meetings that was for radicals is the British West Indian Emancipation Addresses, which he gave almost every year. And there he often uh, will emphasize that, you know, a slave owner has no right to live. Actually, that's a quote from my bondage and my freedom. Um, a slaveholder has no right to live. He is willing to use violence. There's the, he's a founding member, member of the a radical abolition party and uh, 18, that's founded in 1855 that um, explicitly ex accepts violence if necessary in order to vanquish slavery. Uh, he was, um, in terms of black national, uh, you know, uh, so I would define black nationalism in the way that David Walker um, uh, describes it in his uh, brilliant book on the uh, David Walker's appeal to uh, the colored uh, citizens of the world, which is less about integration or separatism and more about um, that blacks uh, ins insist that whites uh, treat blacks on their blacks own term, that if they treat blacks with the kind of pride and respect and dignity that blacks treat themselves, that they don't, that whites do not expect blacks to um, to acquire the mores and the dress and uh, uh, and the comportment of whites, but if that they should be treated with equal respect and, and, that, and that a central theme of black nationalism, this sense of pride. Douglas, when he has to leave the United States for the British Isles after the publication of his first narrative, which is one of his two best-selling autobiographies because he's, he now, he, it's a tell-all and he's still legally a slave and in fact, uh, Hugh All publishes an, a piece in the Baltimore newspaper saying that he will go to any length possible to recapture his property. So Douglas has spent two years in the British Isle and it's the first time he says that there is a virtual dearth of racism. And he comes very close to remaining in the British Isles. The American Anti-Slavery Society would have sent his wife and family over there. The main reason, and he is very open about the main reason, the chief reasons he returns is a sense of responsibility and duty to his fellow blacks to try to end this scourge. And then again, right before, right before the Civil War in 1859, during, uh, during the uh, secession crisis, the period between uh, Lincoln's election and Fort Sumner, uh, when uh, right after, right around Lincoln's inaugural address, Douglas becomes despondent that the nation will do anything to um, make war against these rebels, these people who have committed treason and left the United States, taken up arms against the United States to leave. And Douglas uh, writes in his newspaper that he's planning a trip to Haiti. And if it's the Republic, the glorious Republic that he's read about, he plans to move there. Um, now he doesn't because a few days later, he doesn't even go there because a few days later, Southerners, or, um, Southerners bomb Fort Sumner starting the war. And Douglas is very insightful as a revolutionary. He recognizes, he's one of the first people to recognize that the bombing of Fort Sumner is the golden opportunity, the golden opportunity to end slavery. Um, he was, I think, brilliantly savvy at recognizing of having a pulse on American society as much as anyone. 
If I could just make a, a quick reply to John. Uh, I don't want to get too much into uh, the semantics of whether someone is a, is a revolutionary or a reformer. Uh, I, I certainly agree that Douglas is a radical, uh, remains a radical uh, throughout his career, but it does seem to me that something really significant happens in 1851 when he announces that change of opinion uh, about the Constitution. Because, uh, and, I, and I think you can see the change in how he addresses his audience. It's from that point forward that he addresses his audience as fellow citizens. So after 1851, he is no longer calling for the annulment of the Constitution. Uh, he's wielding the Constitution as a, as a weapon. So he's not calling for regime change. I mean, He's calling for an end to slavery and an end to racial inequality, and those are profound transformations, but he sees them as in line with the nation's saving principles, so that he's working for the perfection or the living out or the realization of those saving principles. Uh, but that, that, that really does seem to me a, a different position. And, and on the question of violence, I mean, I think he's extremely interesting on the question of violence. Uh, and you know, after the uh, after the passage of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law, he's got that essay. You know, is it right and wise to kill a kidnapper? Uh, uh, but uh, even then, when he is legitimizing violence, he does so within his understanding of those American principles, and it's a kind of straightforward Lockean argument. Uh, about what you are authorized to do in defense of your rights or the or the rights of others. So, uh, I, right, but the, the I, Douglas, I, I, yeah, go ahead. I mean, Douglas, I, mean the, I just think we can't Douglas underestimate right that. That is different than the laws at the time on the books. You know, I'm sorry. I said Douglas's defense of his own rights is a wise and wise and right to kill a kidnapper. Under the, circ under the circumstances he sketches out. Yes, but it's not, it's not right according to the laws of the country. So, I mean, it's essentially- Yeah, we're no, it's, I mean, this would, we would have to spend some time, yeah, fl fleshing this out. But I, 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 I mean, I, I think he can make that argument about violence uh, and uh, it's a radical argument, but, uh, in his view, it doesn't set him against those those American principles. Uh, and, and as to his returning, I mean, yeah, it's certainly true he returns for his enslaved brethren, this sense of responsibility, but there is also and always in Douglas this sense of hope. Oh, yeah, but belief I completely that, agree, completely agree. Yeah. But that I think, I mean, a lot of, I mean, when I use the term revolution, I mean, David Blight in his great biography, you know, he emphasizes Douglas was a revolutionary from uh, throughout the 1850s. And it, what is a revolutionary revolution among the other? Um, I mean, a lot of people have different definitions of a revolution. One is you, you're advocating for immediate change. And in that sense, Garrison is a revolutionary. It doesn't matter whether you're, uh, you're pro-slavery or anti-slavery. If you advocate immediate change, you're a revolutionary. Um, and uh, it's, it's just the means by which you want that immediate change. And Douglas yeah, guess, is very clear. He wants immediate change. He wants change as fast as possible. We, we may have a different understanding of what a revolutionary is. I guess I would always connect it with the question of regime uh, and whether you're calling for a, a fundamentally different regime. Uh, but, but even, even his immediatism, uh, I mean, I agree that he remains, uh, you know, an immediatist for the most part. But in shifting to a more political abolitionism, you are inevitably having to moderate somewhat your demands for immediate change. Uh, and I think you see that eventually play out in his greater appreciation of Lincoln uh, and his acknowledgement of the role of political prudence. And, uh, and that means inevitably uh, a kind of gradualism. Yeah. Well, without, without himself occupying that position, he comes to appreciate that position. Right, but that's that's during the war itself. And Douglas yeah. realizes that the, the violence of the war is this opportunity to vanquish slavery. And he's brilliant at pointing out that the our enemies are slave owners. Uh, our friends are blacks and whites in the North. I mean, Douglas is the first person to emphasize that if you want to win the war, you need to treat blacks as equals and as citizens and as soldiers. Um, and if you don't, you're not going to win the war. And by 1864, Lincoln and all the generals, even who had been racist, you know, anything but abolitionists beforehand, Lincoln says, you know, the, 
blacks are a potent weapon. Without them, we will lose. With them, we will win. So essentially, the, the different ideals between a lot of whites and blacks, for Lincoln and for a lot of Republicans, it was simply preserving the union. For Douglas and for most revolutionaries, radicals, it was ending slavery. And by 1863 or 64, they recognized that the, the distinct or the separate aims had been fused into one. You couldn't end slavery without preserving the union. You couldn't preserve the union without ending slavery. The two aims had coalesced into one. Uh, and in a sense, Douglas, I think, is doing that and others who were going back and forth between the um, you know, anti-slavery constitutionalism and pro-slavery constitution. When Douglas was part of uh, Garrison's American Anti-Slavery Society, he downplay uh, the, any kind of advocacy of violence because there was a pacif there was pacifism. Yeah. I mean, you know, so in his brilliant first autobiography, I mean, he defines the turning point of his life with a, as a fight, his fight with Covey. So he, down, yeah. you know, he downplays it. Well, it was a fight, but not that bad of a fight. <laughs> You know, and then by 1850s, he's much more open about it, saying, that, you know, if a if a slave owner comes and tries to take one of my family members, or you know, you have every right to kill that slave owner. So it's it's a matter of um, it's a matter of uh, of context in that sense, and uh, so I mean, I think we're on the yeah, same. Yeah, no, I I agree that his espousal of uh, pacifism was never uh, thoroughgoing. It was. Yeah, the, the, the underlying position was uh, was always there, uh, you know, but I but I wonder, um, you know, why is this uh, why are these absences that we've been talking about the absence of the white abolitionist tradition and the absence of Frederick Douglass? Uh, John, I'm wondering why you think she doesn't show any understanding of that biracial abolitionist movement. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's a good question. I, the short answer is I don't know. Um, I don't know her, I, you know, I, uh, that whole project, I mean, it was, you know, it, as a journalist, you're writing, journalists write with guns to their heads. Um, scholars don't. And um, so a, a generous answer is that she is a journalist, her staff are journalists, they need to get they need to get articles out that they have a vision that are going to coalesce into a book, and then you know once the 1619 project I mean it is it's a hugely popular um, project and so they want it in book form right away and to actually do all the research to um, to address the rich ambiguities would take years I mean that's why scholars take years to write books. So one answer is that, you know, they it's like journalists have a great sense of timing, the timing for a good article, the timing for a good book. They know a good book. I mean, right now is a good time to publish a book, you know, on race. Yeah, and, but, but you, can't, you can't say for the most part. I mean, she does say for the most part, Black Americans fought back alone. But... Yes. That's yes. Just to no, I, I agree. So she, and he lied and yeah, but I okay. So here's another mm -hmm. explanation: is you know when I was a grad student at Yale in the nineteen and I entered in 1993. At that time, the abolition movement for almost all of the 20th century, the abolition movement was defined solely as a white movement, a white movement. Blacks. There were only two right. books on black abolitionists. And they were separated from white abolitionists. And part of that is because white Southerners gained control of the story of the Civil War. And from the 30s until really literally through the 90s, a number of um, whites characterized the abolition movement as a uh, Nazi or in the, like a Nazi or, total, or a Russian or totalitarian regime. They referred to the abolitionists as fellow travelers. A number of scholars in the 30s, 40s, and 50s explicitly likened the abolitionists to totalitarians. And so it was part of the way of um, you know, essentially creating this uh, white America in which slavery wasn't that bad. Um, it was, the Civil War wasn't about slavery. And uh, so it's only been, I mean, Manisha Sinha's book, which is only a few years old, is the first book to emphasize that blacks began, former slaves who now have a voice begin the abolition movement and then from the beginning becomes an integrated movement. And that's a big book and it's an encyclopedic book. And you need to, you know, it's not a book you can read in a day or two. 
uh, but it is, uh, it's immense. Uh, you know, my first book highlighted the integrated nature. I focused on um, Douglas and McCune Smith, the two leading black uh, abolitionists and uh, Garrett Smith and John Brown. And, and I discovered that it was the largest biracial correspondence in the, in the United States at the time, in the 19th century. I thought then, I, I now realize that it's Sumner's correspondence, mm -hmm. Charles Sumner's mm -hmm. correspondence with blacks is even larger. But you read the correspondence and you realize how profound the integrated nature of the abolition movement was. But there is, there is a long mm -hmm. tradition in which abolitionists are cast solely as white. And um, so, you know, I, I, don't know, I don't know her. I'm actually not as familiar with the 1619 Project as, um, as uh, perhaps I should be, or a lot of people, I know their mistakes, but I also, I have, I know journalists. I mean, journalists, um, journalists, um, you know, they need to, they need to, they wanna write a powerful, punchy, argument and they want to do it in uh, very economically they want it out timing they they have a great sense of timing and um, I instead of trashing the 1619 project I think it, it's a start it's like a it's like at the beginning of a book but it now needs to be revised I think it's it's uh, raised consciousness about um, the it, the power, the significance of slavery and race in the United States in a way that scholars, more than scholars have been able to. Um, and and uh, so just building on essentially that first draft and revising it and getting scholars closely involved with it, I think it could lead to a, um, a, a project or a book or a series of books that could be more effective. Uh, much more effective. So I, I'm not di at all disagreeing with the limit with the, the errors or the limitations of the 1619 project. But in, in general, I think it's a you know for for journalists to work with scholars, I think is a good idea because each has different skills that they can bring to the table. Um, and as long as they they take each other seriously and work um, closely together, I think that can be a wonderful collaboration. Um, I just, we've got some questions here from the audience. Uh, my only my only comment on this, I understand that uh, I think it was Madison said that writing the Federalist paper is ever with the printer's devil ever at his elbow, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah, time, yeah. time, yes. And lack of time leads to errors with yeah. scholars yeah. But I mean, is it simply, can we simply attribute to we were in a hurry, uh, to the argument that we were in a hurry? Um, does that simply explain their, the core of their argument, which is that America was founded on slavery and continues to this day with the same moral dynamic? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, frankly, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. I, I think I, I completely agree with you. I just don't know the answer to that. Sure, that's all right. Well, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. It's because there are, you know, there are um, people, there are a number of self-described um, radicals, both on the left and the right, who are, you know, essentially have, don't like the project of the United States. <laughs> um, and uh, so, yeah, I, it's a great question and I don't know the answer to it, but, you know, regardless of the answer, if, if there is a rich collaboration, I mean, your example, Madison, Madison, Madison is a scholar, but he's working with journalists. He's working mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's start there, start there and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Although I think I had Nicole Jones after being buffeted by a number of historians, uh, a number of them not on the political yeah, yeah, know, side, such as uh, Princeton's Sean Wilentz. Yeah. Um, her response was, this was a work of journalism, not a work of history. Right, right. Which is, the, which is, <laughs> which speaks to my point. Essentially, it's an out, you know, journalists, journalists are writing with a gun to their head and they're under pressure. So not everything is going to be, you know, uh, it's not going to be as nuanced. It's not going to be, you know, they're going to be things that are, you know, that are huge exaggerations are wrong, but the, 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 the basic story, and I disagree with the basic story of, you know, saying that 
the abolition movement is just a white movement and abolitionists were horribly racist. I mean, that actually sounds to me like it comes from a white southerner from much of the 20th century because they hated the idea. So it's a way of demonizing that. Uh, well, I would agree. That's what's so alarming is much of what we read in the 1619 Project agrees with Southern, uh, def uh, Southern slaveholders' defenses in the uh, first part of the 19th century. That's what's so troubling about this. I, I, I guess I see it as you know, much more deliberate in that it really is designed as a work of propaganda. Uh, and the speed with which it is spreading shows how uh, effective that has been. Uh, I, I did want to, I think we've got a couple of questions here. We One do. from John Briggs about, uh, I guess everybody can see it, is that right? Uh, about Garrison's condemnation of the Constitution, whether that's the same as the 1619 Project's uh, damning assessment. Uh, yeah, I think there are clear, uh, clear connections. I, I would say in some ways, the 1619 project is worse because it rejects the declaration as well. Yes. Uh, Garrison denounced the constitution in, a, in order to uphold the revolutionary truth of the, of the declaration. And you have the Southerners doing the flip side of that. They uphold the constitution and believe that it, it, it guarantees the perpetuity of slavery. And they denounce the uh, declaration as a, a bunch of self-evident lies. Yes. Uh, but what 1619 does is, is sort of really renounces both of those, uh, those charters. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's a very good point. I mean, I, in fact, in the, by, in the 1850s, there are a number of uh, Southern, white Southerners who engaged in a project to literally rewrite the Declaration, to strip away <laughs> the, the uh, ideals of equality and freedom. They, and, um, they, or they would say, I'm just going to, I think we should need to just totally ignore the Declaration, which is, I mean, one of the, I, I mean, I, because, I mean, I, I, I love Douglas's shift to um, anti-slavery constitutionalism. I mean, Garrison had a harder row to hoe um, because of, I mean, the, the, uh, I'm actually looking at the, the, uh, the constitution um, now. I mean, the preamble is actually all anti-slavery constitutionalists said is that the whole, this whole document is written, the justification for the constitution is to promote the general welfare and to secure the blessings of liberty. That's the aim of this document, to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Uh, and so, I mean, as many scholars have noted, the, the fact that the term slavery, the term black or Negro is never mentioned, that in itself is a kind of victory for the anti-slavery uh, delegates. Um, so they use the term persons. Uh, so you, you definitely see within the Constitution, if you read it closely, the grappling on the ground at the time, um, which I, I actually love. I think that's, I think kids, students would love that, you know. Um, and so, you know, to say it's all one thing or all another is, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't lead to as rich of a conversation anyway. You know, let the students read it themselves. It's like, what do you make of this? I mean, you know, I think a lot of seventh graders would be able to, you know, recognize, well, they're, both sides are grappling here. Both sides are, you know, they're at odds. That's what makes yeah. it, that's what makes it rich. Yeah, I think that probably is the best suggestion that we can make is just to return to the primary materials. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in, I mean, in I always teaching do. all of these things, in yes. teaching the 1850s, in teaching, yes. you know, uh, Lincoln Douglas debates, they've got to read Stephen Douglas and Tawney as well as as well as Lincoln. Yeah. I mean, I, te I teach almost all primary sources, you know, and I, I for that reason, because I want to hear what students have to say. They read it closely and, that, and it leads to really rich discussions. We have another question from the audience. And the question is, any comments uh, from the two of you on the differences between quote unquote English slavery and Spanish slavery? Uh, yes, I can speak to that. Um, English slavery, so England um, really led the way in the emancipation movement. Um, 
the Somerset decision in 1772 essentially becomes the precedent for ending slavery throughout England. And um, virtually every black and white abolitionist, you know, recognized the importance of working with the British to try to end slavery. And then Britain was the first major European country uh, to end their slave society and the British West Indies. And it was, you know, they spent, a, you know, they spent um, uh, millions of pounds to do so. So it was a compensated emancipation, but the fact that they compensated the masters, it didn't bother Americans uh, in a way that's bothered some uh, critics. Spain, the Spain, for a variety of reasons, was much more of a laggard in um, uh, emancipation. And in fact, um, Cuba was uh, a Spanish uh, colony or under Spain. And um, in fact, Southern Americans wanted to annex Cuba um, to ex as part of their effort to expand slavery. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons for that, but the, the best would be to understand the reason for the vigorous anti-slavery uh, aspect of Great Britain. Um, in Great Britain, class was a far greater factor than race. Douglas and uh, others, there are very few blacks. So race wasn't an issue. Uh, class was profound. I mean, at that point, there were like nine different classes. Um, and according to some Brits, even today, it's like upper, 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 middle, lower, uh, or upper, 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 or middle, upper, lower, mid, upper, and then. So um, the what's significant, though, is that the working classes in, in, in England industrialized more quickly than did um, than did the United States far more quickly. So factory labor um, and uh, the exploitation of working classes uh, happened a lot quicker. Um, but the working classes in England prided themselves on their free labor, prided themselves on being free laborers, no matter how much they were exploited. So this idea of I am free and I am a labor was central to their identity which meant that when they looked at slaves in the British West Indies, they hated the very idea of someone working without being receiving wages, no matter how paltry they were. So in, in the British Isles, something like 97, 98% of the population were abolitionists. It was huge, huge. Whereas in uh, United States, um, that sense of, pride and dignity in work itself wasn't, especially factory work was not as um, profound as it was in, in, in England. Although Lincoln says this when he's running for the president that, in, um, that most Northerners were actually artisans. They were craftspeople. I mean, most Northerners on the eve of the Civil War were family farmers. So Lincoln emphasized that he believed that every, every American, white or black, he says, I inc including black women, have the right to receive the fruits of his or her own labor. That reflects a craft or artisanal idea. You're a farmer or you're a blacksmith or you're a lawyer or you're a photographer or you're a seamstress or you're a teacher, but you have a craft that you utilize, that you make, that you make earn a living room. You receive the fruits of your own labor. Most Northerners were family farmers, um, and uh, and and Lincoln recognized that that free labor ideal uh, coalesced very nicely with anti-slavery, um, and. Uh, I, I mean, there are different reasons why the Brit, Brits were far more inclined to connect um, uh, free labor with anti-slavery. The main one is that the United States had a far greater problem than Britain is that slavery is in their front yard. For Brits, slavery is f what, 4,000 miles away? It may, and the seats of power are in London. It's easier to end slavery mm -hmm. when when the, your slave society is four thousand miles away, when it's in your front yard, your backyard. I mean, there's a there was a slave auction house that 
that was less than, it was basically a mile from the US Capitol until 1850. It's literally in the front yard of the United States. You can't avoid it. Mm -hmm. That makes a huge difference. Yes, good. Thank you. We have another question from a member of our audience who asks this. Why are American public schools adopting the 1619 Project curriculum? <laughs> That's a very good question. I, it's a very, I don't, I, you know, I, I, you, uh, Diana, you feel free to take a step. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's my understanding is that each school system has its own, um, you know, has its own, uh, you know, decides for itself. I mean, I, mean, I can just uh, take a brief step. One is that, you know, we're the, the cultural moment we're in. I mean, the if you believe the New York Times, the New York Times a, a month or so ago said that we're in the midst of the um, largest protest movement, at least since the civil rights era. Um, and uh, so there's this, there's been a, you know, according to many people, a consciousness raising, okay, gee, gee whiz, race and slavery are important factors in America. So what's an easy textbook and the 1619 project is advertising itself as being available, is, is being designed for the schools. Okay, we'll take that. I mean, Diane, you might have. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's part of it. I mean, uh, teachers always like pre-packaged pre curricula. So to get a jump on that and to put something out there and the website, you know, is not just the original essays, but all kinds of study questions and texts and so on. Uh, so they were, they were smart in uh, having all of that prepared. Um, and not only the cultural moment, but the underlying phenomenon of white guilt and uh, and I think behind that, a, a really serious question, and I see it in students, uh, when they take American national government or American political thought, I find it's actually very difficult to get them to even think seriously about something like the separation of powers until you have confronted that first question, do we have to be ashamed of our founding? And and that's a serious question. And most of them arrive at college having been told, yes, you should be ashamed. You know, no, the, 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 the declaration done, you know, when they said all men, they didn't mean all men. They gave it a restrictive and exclusionary reading and the constitution, you know, itself is a uh, despicable document tainted by these compromises with slavery. And so, uh, it's, I think it's easy just to second that and say, yeah, here's a whole bunch of stuff that, that, uh, that seems to show that that's true. Uh, instead, it, it seems to me what we have to do is uh, really confront that question very seriously and go back and look at the primary text and work through the material and come to some judgment. And our judgments will be compounded of both praise and blame. What I would like to see is us getting to a, a, a better balance between that praise and blame. Uh, and it requires getting students to step out of themselves and into another time period and another era, not in a relativistic way, but in a, in a, in a you know, uh, an act of the historical imagination. Uh, and I, I think that's really missing right now. Students don't read as much literature, they don't read as much real, real history, and they, they don't know how to, they, they don't have that capacity uh, of the historical imagination. And I, I don't think they're gonna get an accurate read uh, on the founders uh, and, until they're able to do that. Yeah, it's a, a good point. I, it actually um, makes me think all the more reason to read the abolitionist writings themselves. <laughs> because, you know, even the Garrisonians, I mean, <laughs> There wasn't a there wasn't a black or white or white radical in who didn't love the Declaration for That's its right. advocacy yeah. of That's these right. natural rights of freedom and equality. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean that would be yeah. That's it's um, and it's a it's a 
I think, in fact, I just taught the declaration today in a class. Um, it's a seminar and, you know, Jefferson was, John Adams asked Jefferson to draft it, not because he liked Jefferson necessarily, but he wanted, he wanted who he thought was the best writer um, to draft it. So he, there was an understanding that it was not just, that, that a great political document also had a literariness, that it had a music and, and it was something that, that, cap, that grabbed you by the throat that you didn't want to let go of. Um, and it is, you know, the first, those first two paragraphs are brilliant works of, of prose poetry in my opinion. Yeah, and I, I might add, I mean, I, I think there is another uh, underlying issue, and that's our current doubts about the existence of natural rights. So it's not only that people are, people suspect that the founders didn't really, you know, apply these natural rights to every human being, but it's also that we aren't so sure ourselves anymore that we believe in, uh, that we believe in natural rights. Uh, there's something in a way so absolutist about that. Um, so I, I, I think that's another, another big topic that has to be confronted. Yes, I, I, would, yeah. only add, only, I would only add to that because uh, I think you're, I think both what you're both saying about this is right as to the reasons for the receptivity. Um, I think part of the reason for the receptivity is the growing civic illiteracy, not only of our students, but of those who teach them. I mean, we know that 90% of immigrants pass the US citizenship test the first time. All it takes is six out of 10 questions uh, co answered correctly. And out of a hundred question database, all the questions and answers you can examine before you take the test. Well, the good news is 90% of them pass it. The bad news is only 19% of native born Americans under the age of 45 can get even six out of 10 right. So I think that when you have a civically illiterate population uh, that then, I mean, cause we all know we have the statement that all men are created equal, but we also had slavery at the same time. Without some education in the primary texts, it's very easy to see why an argument such as that made by the 1619 project should appear persuasive. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I agree. Liter and f I follow some um, people studying literacy in the United States, and I, I use it in the my courses on the slavery, anti-slavery, the Civil War era, and you know, it, literacy rates in the antebellum North were far higher than they were in the antebellum South because uh, they advocated uh, common school. Uh, they started advocating common schools. In the South, slaves were prohibited from reading or writing. Right. Uh, the law in virtually every state. Um, and so the illiteracy rate was a lot, a lot higher. Every, every scholar of literacy has pointed out that with the rise of the internet and the rise of um, people receiving information visually, people, Americans are reading far less. Um, yes. You read far less and uh, it, it, it throws the whole question of democracy into a question because democracy depends upon the ability of the electorate uh, to be able to read so they, they can first understand those running for office and to be able to distinguish between a confidence man and a statesman. Yes, confidence and all man. this happening at a time when we have more and more students graduating or at least attending college than ever before in our history. Yeah. Which does suggest that some of the responsibility for this has to be laid at the front door of our universities. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, you're right. I, um, a lot of schools, um, I mean, I'm at an elite institution, Harvard, but it, we have a general education curriculum. So everyone has to take within the general education <laughs> curriculum courses in the sciences and social sciences and the humanities but one of the moves in a lot of higher education or in higher education over the past 10 15 years is to do away with requirements that you 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 choose a major but everything else can be an elective you might have requirements within the major but if you don't want to take a science you don't have to or if you want to be a scientist and you don't want to take a humanities course you don't have to um, and 
I mean, there's a huge debate on, I, I believe that um, part of education is exposing students to the world of knowledge, not just uh, the field that you're interested in. Yes. Well, this has been going by much too quickly. So let me turn, try to get in at least one more question from our audience. Um, I think, uh, Tom, are you looking at the same one I'm looking at? Do you have the one about the indentured servant? Oh, yes. I, I was going to try to get to that and the other one, but uh, okay. to read the one about the indentured servant. And, and yeah, it's very uh, short. It's from someone named G. Seaver, uh, yes. who says <laughs> Robert Seaver, uh, right. I take it, uh, an ancestor, arrived in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1634 as an indentured servant. Where does this stand in the protest hierarchy? So I'm... Uh, not quite uh, sure what's but, being asked there, whether, uh, you know, whether you're going to be in the uh, list for reparations or not, but I, uh, I, uh, I suspect not. Um, yeah. <laughs> the protest, that, that's a, so um, the vast majority of Europeans who came to um, North America were indentured servants, um, which meant that they were unfree the difference between an indentured servant and a slave is that indentured servant, you had to work for no wages. You were essentially owned by a owner. You were indentured to someone else. But after a period of years, it was 10 or 15 years, then you acquired your freedom. Uh, indentured servitude um, functioned on the ground um, similar to slavery that you, you really didn't have much of a public voice. Um, and in fact, there's um, American Slavery, American Freedom points out the classic book in American history, um, how indentured servants um, uh, collaborated or saw themselves as like slaves. And uh, then there was a divide between them the main difference legally between an indentured servant and a slave is that um, slave was also seen as uh, literally legally chattel, meaning that one could be bought or sold. A servant, you could, you could transfer, you could actually sell the servitude for the servant, but only for the years left in the contract. Yeah, it, it might also be worth mentioning that the distinction between indentured servitude and slavery uh, was one that Frederick Douglass made much of in his interpretation of the so-called fugitive slave clause in the Constitution. Yes. So um, Douglass construed that, quote, fugitive slave clause as not, in fact, having any reference at all to fugitive slaves. Uh, he believed that it could apply only to indentured servants who had signed contracts and who therefore had, uh, you know, a, a, an obligation and could be held to that legal contract. So if they tried to skip out, skip out of town, uh, they could be returned to the person to whom that service or labor may be due. Uh, I think that's not an interpretation. Uh, well, it certainly was not the mainstream understanding of the interpretation. Uh, uh, there was understood to be such a thing as a fugitive slave clause. But uh, here you see, you know, Douglass's uh, uh, literalism and reading the words carefully at work. I mean, he does go back to Madison's notes and he says, look, when this idea came up, the delegates from South Carolina and Georgia said that, you know, we want a clause in here that says that fugitives should be, fugitives from slavery should be delivered up like criminals. Uh, we don't get any debate in the, in the general session. It gets tossed back to the committee. We don't really know what happens there, but the language we get back is very different. And now there's no mention of, uh, of, uh, of slavery at all. And Douglas says, if it doesn't say slave, it doesn't mean slave. And there certainly is a class of people whom this language could apply to, uh, that the clause does seem to carry implications of contract. Uh, and so he just really, uh, you know, has this interpretation that does away with the fugitive slave clause, which means that the 1793 law and the 1850 law uh, don't have constitutional standing in his view. Uh, I, I think it really shows the limits of Douglas's moral tolerance that he would have had a very hard time looking on the Constitution favorably 
if it had included a fugitive slave clause. Um, and it seems to me this is also the main point of disagreement between Douglas and Lincoln in the way in which they read the read the Constitution. Yeah, so I'm, I, I I can just read for people who haven't memorized it, the Fugitive Slave Clause. Uh, it's uh, Article Four: No person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping into another shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. I mean, the, the vagueness of the definition, I mean, that's, that's why anti-slavery constitutionalists were far more popular for there were far more of them than there were pro-slavery because it's like you see the language, they're, they're trying to jump circles or go through hoops to, uh, to downplay the legitimacy for slavery in the Constitution uh, with this, you know, person uh, held to service or labor. <laughs> it's, uh, you, it's as though, you know, the, the, the framers or Madison, whoever actually was res responsible for penning this clause, is embarrassed by it, is uncomfortable with it. Um, and we know that it's a function of, during the constitutional debate, debates, delegates from Georgia and South Carolina, they wanted the, the very term slavery to be explicit in the constitution. They wanted blacks to be explicit in the constitution. So in a sense, this, um, this language is a victory for uh, the anti-slavery delegates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. because it doesn't give any moral standing to the institution. Uh, right. If it is the case that it is providing this protection to the slave holders, uh, it makes very clear that slavery exists only by municipal or state law, right? In the, in the laws uh, there under uh, and not uh, at, the, at the level of the, of the federal constitution. So it, it, it is you know, an instance of quite brilliant draftsmanship yeah. to make a prudential accommodation with the institution of slavery while at the same time depriving the institution of moral standing. Right, and unfortunately the precedents that build up are such that that's, that was the hurdle is that, you know, mm -hmm. that it was both, you know, law is close reading the constitution and the precedents that are developed. And there's so many precedents of people of lawyers and judges interpreting this as sanctioning slavery, it becomes by 1840s difficult to overturn that. But I completely agree yeah. with you. <laughs> completely. We've only got. I'm afraid to. Uh, I'm afraid we only have about three minutes left. So before I ask each of you to give a 90 second final uh, statement, I want to tell our audience that. Uh, that this conference will return tomorrow at noon Eastern, 11 Central Time. Uh, in, and uh, there, uh, Professor Susan Hansen, who's the chair of the history department at the University of Dallas, will talk about the spirit of the Adams family. Uh, Professor Schaub, would you like to? Oh, well, I've uh, never been much for uh, concluding statements, so I think I will just say read more Frederick Douglass, uh, read more Abraham Lincoln, uh, and uh, st stay away from contemporary authors completely. Amen. Amen to that. <laughs> I, would, I would echo that. Except for, I, the, except for those on the panel here. <laughs> um, I'll put in a plug for one of my books, Pick the Portable Frederick <laughs> Douglass. So it's actually, I collected with Skip Gates some of what we think is Doug, or Douglass's great writings. But just to echo what Diana said, read, read the abolitionists themselves, read them for yourself. Read black and white abolitionists, male and female abolitionists. There's some very good volumes. There's a, a nice, a wonderful little collection of uh, William Lloyd Garrison's uh, newspaper articles. In fact, Douglas and newspaper, Douglas and Garrison helped to create modern journalism where they lead with the opening thesis. I mean, before them, 
much of most of journal, almost all of journalism, it was the part of the belletristic tradition. So it's like it took you two thirds of the essay before you knew what the basic argument is. Um, and uh, they were both magnificent journalists, but they also wrote, you know, Douglas is, I think, almost unmatched as an orator. Um, I mean, he, he could, him, in his own day, he could command one of the highest speaking fees um, of white or black orators at a time during the golden age of oratory. Um, and abolitionists recognize part of the reason they're such good writers and such great speakers is because they recognize the degree to which words were such potent and could be such potent weapons. Well, I know that I speak for everyone in the audience when I say thank you to both of you for really a stir your sterling presentations and your conversation thereafter. This has been very illuminating. Thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, Take thank care. you, everybody. And uh, just before you leave, that's 11 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow. That's the, ah, the first, 11 a.m. Yes, with Susan Hansen, associate professor at the University of Texas on the Adams family. Thank you for correcting that chance. I would have felt very bad all night if I had set people off at the wrong time. So thank you for correcting that. Thank you all. Thank you, John. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Thomas. See thank you guys. You. Oh, thank you, Thomas, okay. for uh, moderating. You were My terrific. pleasure. Thank you, My Diane. pleasure. Okay.